Um, thank you so much to everybody who's come along. Welcome to this Ovarian Cancer Action webinar. Uh, my name is Jo and I'm Cancer Prevention Officer at Ovarian Cancer Action. So as you know, today's topic is HRT for those of us with an inherited risk of cancer. Um, this webinar is one of a series of workshops and webinars that's part of the joint Staying Connected programme between Ovarian Cancer Action and Overcome. We've got all sorts of other sessions coming up, so please do take a look at the programme and also let us know if there's a topic that you really want us to cover because we are booking these in based on demand and what people are asking for. So um, we've also recently set up a monthly newsletter specifically for people with a high genetic risk um, and that's got updates on kind of COVID situation and screening, research guidelines and so on. So um, please do sign up for that if that's something you want to keep up to date with. A little bit of info first on how this session will work. Um, so in today's webinar, you'll be able to see myself and our guest expert, Dr. Newsom, but not each other. Um, and everyone's on mute just to limit background noise. And part of the reason for that is because we're recording the session so that we can share it with you and anyone else who can't make it today um, and might find it useful. So please don't feel you need to take copious notes or anything as you will be able to watch it back once we post it to our website. Um, you'll see on the bottom of your screen, there'll be some buttons. Um, Feel, please feel free as we go along to ask questions using the Q&A function. Um, I'll keep those questions anonymous when I read them out. I won't read out any names or anything. Um, and as I've mentioned already, we'll try and get through as many questions as we can today. Um, but this has been a really, really popular session and with lots of questions already sent in. So I do apologise in advance if we don't manage to cover absolutely every single question today. But if you have a burning question that we miss, um, please do get in touch. It's bracker at ovarian.org.uk um, and I'll do my best to get it answered for you. Um, so to introduce our guest expert today, uh, Dr. Louise Newson is a GP and menopause specialist who is really passionate about making sure we all have access to good information about the menopause and HRT. I'm not going to list all the different things uh, that she's involved in because that would take all day, but I do suggest you take a look at her website, which is menopausedoctor.co.uk. Um, and also follow on Instagram um, because she's got all sorts of really useful videos on there to watch as well and so much information. Um, I do want to say though that um, Dr. Newson is here to answer all your questions on all aspects of HRT and cancer risk, but this isn't a medical consultation. So as always, we do advise you to please consult your medical team about your own personal situation before you make any decisions on any of this. So um, thank you so much for joining us, Louise. I really wanted to rattle through that bit because I know we've got so much to talk about. So um, I wonder if you could kick off by just telling us a little bit about why this is something you're so passionate about um, and maybe a brief overview of how um, you know, HRT and the menopause and so on relates mm. to inherit inherited cancer risk. Absolutely. So thanks ever so much for inviting me. It's a real privilege to be here and um, hopefully we'll help a few people. Um, obviously, I can just give general advice, but um, there is lots more information elsewhere. So um, I'm a GP, not a gynaecologist, and a lot of menopause specialists are actually gynaecologists. So I'm a bit unusual um, for lots of reasons. But one of the things is that it's it's making people aware about what the menopause is, because for a lot of women, it's a it's a word and it's not a nice word necessarily. And and it has quite negative connotations with it um, and the menopause isn't a medical condition and um, so you might wonder why a doctor is talking about something that's a natural process we all go through it if we live long enough and so the majority of women will go through it at some stage and as a lot of you know um, the menopause occurs because our eggs run out our eggs are produced by our ovaries and when we produce eggs we produce hormones so when our eggs are depleted if it's a natural menopause then our hormones are depleted as well um, but actually a lot of women go through menopause early for different reasons sometimes it can be because their ovaries are removed because they're diseased or for a lot of women because there's a risk of ovarian cancer so they'll be removed and without your ovaries you you are menopausal you don't need a, a blood test or a scan or anything, it, it's back. Um, some women have their womb removed and still have their ovaries, but those women can have an earlier menopause because the womb and the ovaries are very closely linked, the blood supply is linked, so people who have a hysterectomy often can have an earlier menopause. Some people have medical treatments, so um, treatments that block the function of the ovaries working um, either temporary or permanently and can then have a medical menopause or they can have chemotherapy or radiotherapy that can affect the function of the ovaries. So women of all ages can become menopausal. My youngest patient's 18, my oldest patient's 94. Um, and um, the menopause is not just about symptoms. So 
you break down the word menopause, meno is menstrual cycle, pause is stop. So it's officially when we haven't had a period for a year. But a lot of women, if they have a natural menopause, will have perimenopausal symptoms. So it will, these are symptoms that start to come when periods are still happening, and that can occur for quite a few years. If people have a surgical menopause, and it, it happens at a younger age, often it's a very harsh, very unnatural menopause, because as you can imagine, you're producing hormones and then suddenly they're gone, and, and the body has this awful reaction thinking what's going on I was enjoying these hormones and the reason that it's so important that we know about it is because estrogen affects every cell in our bodies I can't think of one cell it doesn't affect so it affects our brain cells it affects our bones it affects our um, cardiovascular system it affects our joints it affects our eyes our mouth our um, urinary system our vaginas um, and the reason that I'm saying all this is because without these hormones, all these tissues are affected and don't work as well. So a lot of people, when they say, when you ask, what is the menopause? They'll say, well, it's, it's about a, a irritable woman having a, with a fan. And actually, yes, of course, hot flushes, night sweats are a very common symptom due to the low estrogen levels. But actually, because estrogen affects us in, uh, in all these different places, it causes other symptoms so symptoms such as low mood low energy reduced motivation anxiety uh, poor concentration memory loss brain fog joint pains muscle stiffness urinary symptoms recurrent urinary tract infections vaginal dryness and discomfort even things like dry eyes dry mouth sore mouth dizziness um, any because it affects our systems in so many ways it can cause symptoms and People sometimes talk about the number of symptoms, whether there's 86 or 92 or whatever. It doesn't matter because everyone's different and symptoms can change. So sometimes people um, find that they get working headaches and migraines, they improve, but then they find that they become more lethargic or they become lower in their mood. And it can be very difficult sometimes because there's not a simple blood test to diagnose the menopause. Our hormone levels change a lot. Um, and so a lot of women are then misdiagnosed and told that they're depressed or they've got fibromyalgia or they've got um, urine infections and people don't piece it together. Even women who've had a surgical menopause, so it's very obvious what's causing it. So um, the, the best way really of diagnosis is, is filling out a questionnaire. And there's one on my website, menopausedoctor.co.uk, if you just search for questionnaire. And if you have symptoms that are new and there's no reason for them, then you need to think about your hormones. And if you're still having periods, often it's easier if you track them because then you can see whether there's been a change, but if you've had your ovaries or your womb removed and you're getting these symptoms, you should really be talking to a healthcare professional about could it be your hormones. And um, it's very important as well, not just because of symptoms, but about our future health. So because hormones affect all our systems, without hormones for a long period of time, women have an increased risk of certain diseases. So diseases such as heart disease, osteoporosis, diabetes, depression, dementia. So very important, relevant and common conditions that increase when we don't have hormones in our bodies. So for a lot of women, it's very important to consider replacing hormones with HRT. But also it's looking at other ways of improving our, our lives and our lifestyles because none of us want to go and see a doctor. None of us want disease. So it's looking at ways of improving our cardiovascular health, our brain health, our bone health as well. Um, so there will be some women who maybe don't want to take HRT or can't take HRT, but actually there's very few women that can't. And hopefully I'll be able to tease some of that in the questions. Um, HRT is only three letters, hormone replacement. And actually insulin is a hormone replacement treatment. Thyroxine is a hormone replacement treatment. And estrogen and also testosterone, which is a female hormone as well as a male hormone, they're just hormone replacements. There's different doses, there's different types, we're all individuals. And the most important thing about menopause care is that women are given individual advice and, um, and treatment. Um, and treatment can sometimes change. You know, some people need different doses after a few years or a different um, type of HRT as well. Um, but one of the reasons that HRT is important is that 
obviously if you replace the hormones properly, the symptoms will go. So that's lovely for those women who are really experiencing symptoms, but also it reduces future risk of all these diseases. So for example, women who take HRT have a 50% reduction in heart attacks, and most of us will die from cardiovascular disease. It reduces the risk of osteoporosis, dementia, diabetes, even obesity. Um, so there are real health benefits of getting your hormones right. Um, but we need to look at our diets as well, look at our gut health, look at our um, fat intake, looking make sure we have healthy fats such as olive oil, avocado, nuts, seeds, not having processed food, not having sugar. Um, there's a lot of alternative treatments that are marketed at the moment and it's a massive marketing industry. Um, so there's anything I think that is labelled as a menopause supplement shouldn't be used because it's often expensive. Um, and there's very little evidence that some of these supplements really work. And you have to think, why are you taking them? If you're taking them for your symptoms, so sometimes people take sage, for example, for their hot flushes, that's absolutely fine, but it's not going to help their bone health and heart health. So you need to think about what you're taking. Some people will take a supplement such as omega-3, which can help, or a fish oil, which can help with our um, cardiovascular system. It might not help with symptoms, but it might help with future health. So it's, you can see it's very important to have the right balance of supplements, really. Everyone should be taking vitamin D, which is a government recommendation, because vitamin D is very good for our bone health, um, and it might have other benefits as well. There are some other treatments that we sometimes give to women who are having very severe symptoms and can't have HRT in the first line. So we sometimes give antidepressants, but not for the low mood. So any woman who's been offered antidepressants for low mood, anxiety, symptoms related to their hormones, it's not going to work. There's no evidence it helps unless these women have got clinical depression. But we sometimes give antidepressants for the vasomotor symptoms, so such as the sweats and flushes, they can sometimes help. Um, and then there are other treatments you might have heard of things like um, gabapentin or pregabalin, which actually work as epileptic drugs, but at low doses they can help with some of the, the sweats and flushes. But we often limited by side effects. Um, and then I've already mentioned about vaginal symptoms, so symptoms such as vaginal dryness. And a lot of women, and sadly doctors, think that's only relevant if women are sexually active and have penetrative sex. But actually, I see and speak to a lot of women who have discomfort sitting down. They have pain wearing underclothes, they can't cycle, they can't swim because they can't wear a swimming costume. So it's not just about sex. And we know around 80% of women who have gone through the menopause will experience some symptoms related to vaginal dryness and also urinary symptoms as well. But only about 7% of women ex actually receive adequate treatment, which is beyond shocking. Now, women who um, can't have HRT in the first instance, and that's usually women who've had an estrogen receptor positive cancer in the past, um, can still safely use vaginal estrogen because they're very different. Vaginal estrogen are things like a pessary or a cream or there's a ring, and they only work locally in the vagina. So they don't work in the rest of the body. And they work really efficient, efficiently to improve the symptoms of vaginal dryness and the urinary symptoms. So anyone who's listening to this can definitely use vaginal um, estrogen because there aren't any real contraindications. Even women who've had an estrogen receptor for cancer can still use, safely use vaginal estrogen. Um, so there are lots of different treatments and lifestyle treatments that can make a real difference. And, um, and even women who have had a family history of any type of cancer can still take HRT. Now, the biggest reason that people worry about HRT is the perceived risk of breast cancer. So I'm just going to mention it for a couple of minutes. I've talked about the benefits of HRT. Um, so women and healthcare professionals are worried about this breast cancer risk. If you look at the actual data, it's really important to know the facts. So estrogen is the safe part. So women who've had a hysterectomy and have estrogen and no progesterone actually have a slightly lower risk of breast cancer, um, which is not what a lot of women and people would expect. Women who have the synthetic older type of progesterogen, a big study that came out um, 18 years ago showed there was a very small increased risk. But when you look at the magnitude of risk, 
a woman who drinks a couple of glasses of wine at night or a woman who's overweight actually has a higher risk of breast cancer than a woman taking HRT. So it's a small, very small increased risk. The natural body identical progesterone that we usually use if a woman needs progesterone, there's been shown there's no increased risk for five years. And after this time, the risk is lower than the older types. So in fact, it's negligible which is very reassuring. But sadly, the um, public don't know all the facts and even the medical profession don't know the facts because we keep being fed wrong information. There has never been a study that shows that women who take HRT have a, lower, um, have a um, higher risk of death from breast cancer. They might have um, a slightly higher risk of developing breast cancer, but not from death. Um, and that's really important for us to know as women when we're deciding whether HRT is us or not we need to look at our overall risk our overall potential benefits um, and then weigh it up as, as you know individuals that we can make our own decisions but if we're not given the right information it's very hard to make the right decisions so um, some people think that taking HRT will just delay symptoms but actually it what it will do is improve symptoms when you have them but it will also help with your health benefits you know the longer term health benefits so there's no need to wait until your symptoms are really bad because you won't get a medal. No one will say, well done for suffering. Um, and the earlier women take it, the better it is for their bone and heart and, and future health as well. So, um, but even women who really feel they can't take HRT, it's certainly worth seeing a doctor who specializes in the, in the menopause because a lot of women are still sadly incorrectly told they can't take HRT. And some women have tried various other alternatives and are still not getting help. Um, and if you're not getting help or not being listened to, it's really important to get the right help and advice. So there's a lot of information, a lot of talking in a very short space of time, but I hope that sort of set the scene a little bit and given you some food for thought. Absolutely. And I think um, that that part you were discussing there about cancer risk is something that comes up an awful lot. And I do speak to a lot of women who have been told in the past that even though they haven't had cancer themselves, that just because they have, say, a mutation, that they aren't, aren't allowed to take yeah. HRT. So um, I think that's really useful information for everybody to um who's who's here now uh, and we did actually have quite a lot of questions that were just along those lines of you know um i've been advised i shouldn't take hrt if i carry a BRCA mutation or a lynch syndrome mutation um so i guess for for people who don't know anything about what options there are in terms of hrt and uh thinking about having this risk reducing surgery in the next mm -hmm. years um is there an almost a standard option for say a high risk woman who hasn't had cancer who's um thinking of having her ovaries and fallopian tubes removed um what's kind of the standard option um for for hrt and is it different if she decides to have her uterus removed as well yeah so really good question so yes it, it can be different the most important thing if someone's having risk reducing surgery is to discuss in advance because it's it's a lot harder to discuss afterwards and especially if you're recovering from surgery and you're starting to experience menopausal symptoms it can be a lot harder so it's a lot better to have the facts um, and the knowledge beforehand and it might not actually be your surgeon who's the best person who knows about the menopause and, and HRT. If a woman has had her womb removed so we had a hysterectomy then usually she doesn't need a progesterone she just needs estrogen um, and so women who have estrogen only HRT I've already said actually have a lower future risk of breast cancer so actually women who have had a hysterectomy are, are lucky if you like. Um, women who've had um, their ovaries removed need to have estrogen and a progesterone if they've still got their womb. Now having estrogen through the skin as a patch or gel and now there's a spray available too means there's no risk of clot. So having oestrogen as a tablet, there's a very small increased risk of clot. For most women, the risk is still low, but if there's a safer alternative and it's a natural body identical oestrogen, it's derived from the yam, the root vegetable. It's a lot safer than the synthetic contraceptive pill, for example. Um, so certainly I would consider um, taking or using oestrogen as a patch gel or, or, or the spray. If women are young, so if they're under 45 and have an early menopause or a surgical menopause the guidelines are very clear that these women really have to have hrt and 
any type of HRT in young women, there's no risk of breast cancer because you're just replacing the hormones that would otherwise be there. And certainly women are designed, if you like, to have hormones in their body until at least the age of 51. So um, it doesn't really matter which type, but the, if you want the safest and the um, type with the most evidence, then it would be having estrogen through the skin. And then if you've got your womb, this natural progesterone, there's only one type, it's called micronized progesterone, and it comes with a capsule. Um, a lot of women who are young who have a surgical menopause benefit from testosterone as well, which is a, a really important hormone that we produce in our ovaries. And we actually produce more testosterone than estrogen. Yet we're always told estrogen is a female hormone, testosterone is a male hormone. But testosterone can be very good for mood, energy, concentration, motivation, stamina, and also improve libido as well. And frustratingly, there isn't a licensed preparation of testosterone available to us, which is absolutely outrageous in my mind that we're not allowed our own hormone back. Um, but there are ways of, of having it. There is a male testosterone, um, clearly they're allowed their own hormone back, um, which can be prescribed um, at lower doses in the NHS or privately there's a female testosterone cream that we often use in our clinic. It works out about 80p a day. Um, so there are options and a lot of women say, well I've tried HRT and it's not working, there's no point using it. And that's often because they're not on the right dose or type. And young women often need a lot higher doses than older women because they're designed to use and need more, more hormones. So if it's not working for you, rather than putting it in the bin, just think about maybe talking to someone about changing the dose of time. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, kind of unpicking it a little bit more, we did actually have a couple of questions specifically asking um, from women who haven't yet had their risk-reducing mastectomy and are having the, their ovaries out first. Now, I know you've mentioned um, that the the HRT isn't going to increase your risk of breast cancer significantly mm. but that specific question there is would there be a different um, advice for somebody who's not had their breast removed yet for example compared to somebody who already has had a mastectomy? No so if, we, if these are women who are having mastectomy for risk reducing reasons so not because they've had breast cancer because they've got an increased risk then no they can have any type of HRT and it's actually women, and the problem is with menopause research is there's, there's very little really, really good robust studies. And so when you look at the studies, a lot of them haven't been done very well. And then we're interpreting some studies that haven't been done very well, and they're often misreported as well. But we do know that women who have BRCA gene who take HRT, there's some evidence that they actually have a lower future risk of breast cancer if they take HRT. So which is actually quite hard to get your head around when you've been told for a long time you can't take HRT because your mother, auntie, cousin, sister, grandmothers have breast cancer. And so HRT does not cause breast cancer. It will not initiate breast cancer. Um, what hormones do is that they will stimulate cells to grow. So therefore they will stimulate cells in our bones to grow and be strong. They'll stimulate cells in our brains to to sort of be woken off, if you like, and, and work properly. They'll stimulate cells in our skin. So our skin's often better, more lubricated, got more collagen in it. So if someone has a breast cancer already, it might stimulate some of those cells to grow more. And so therefore women might find that they have a breast cancer picked up a bit earlier, but it won't have caused their breast cancer. So a lot of women tell me that my, their mother or their sister or their relative had breast cancer and it was caused by HRT. Well, of course it wasn't, but it's a very simplistic way of thinking, well, if you've had an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, then estrogen must have caused it. Now it's not so simple as that, we know that. And in fact, estrogen used to be a treatment for breast cancer in the past. Um, and there's some evidence that estrogen actually stops breast cancer cells becoming worse and improving prognosis. So, it's not as simple as that, but doctors often think it is and women think it is. And if you've been told things, it can be very difficult to push back against what you've been told by a doctor. But this certainly, um, the, the authorities, the, the menopause societies, menopause specialists are very um, unanimous, if you like, in their response and advice about women who have an increased risk of breast cancer can still take HRT. And certainly if women are young, 
then you're not having your ovaries removed to stop your periods. You're having your ovaries removed because then there's a risk of ovarian cancer. Um, so your hormones are the good bits. It's just your ovaries are potentially the bad bits. Um, and so it's thinking about the difference really. Some women have their ovaries removed if they've had breast cancer because the oncologist wants to minimise oestrogen exposure. Um, but actually that, that's quite, um, it, the benefit of that surgery is, is actually quite low if you look for an individual woman. But that's a different reason for having ovaries removed than if a woman's got BRCA gene and it's having them removed for risk reducing uh, reasons. But a lot of doctors just sort of lump us women together as a, just a, Thing and we're on a conveyor belt and none of us are a conveyor belt we're all different and we all have choices and we choose to drive a car we choose what we do and obviously it's been a bit more restricted with lockdown how to choose what we do but generally we can decide as long as we've got the right information so um so women generally can still safely take hrt that's brilliant thank you um we had quite a few questions in actually from people um who carry a BRCA mutation or Lynch syndrome mutation who've been advised to only take hrt for a limited time so could you tell us whether it's correct that they should stop taking hrt at around 51 or whether they should continue and whether an nhs doctor would actually prescribe hrt past 51 yeah absolutely so if you look at the guidelines for women who are young so under the age of 45 the guidelines say that women should take hrt for at least the age until at least the age of 51 which is the natural age of the, the menopause um so that is no one can argue with that now beyond that the guidelines then the nice guidance say that women can continue taking hrt as long as the benefits outweigh the risk so when you look at the benefits the benefits obviously are for symptoms as i've explained but also for future health, so reducing risk of heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis, dementia, and so forth. So for most women, the benefits carry on at weighing the risk. So there isn't a time length. A lot of women think they have to stop after so many years or after when they reach a certain age, and that's not true at all. Um, and I, for example, take HRT, and I could stop taking it tomorrow and have, maybe have no symptoms. My symptoms might have disappeared. But then I've got this increased risk of osteoporosis and dementia, which I'm actually personally don't want to get quite scared of getting. So it's about looking at why you're taking something. And sadly, a lot of doctors haven't had any training in the menopause and healthcare professionals. So they um, think that women have to stop taking it after certain lengths of time. But I think when women know why they're taking it, and have an educated discussion with their doctor, then doctors are actually more amenable to um, being listened to. And if they're not, then I, you should really seek advice for someone else. You could always compare to um, someone who's got an underactive thyroid gland or had their thyroid gland removed. Would they only take thyroxine for a few years and then stop? Well, of course they wouldn't. And it's, it's no different. It's just another hormone that's really important in our bodies. Um. Something that's come up a few times um, also is I've spoken to women who were told, say, five, ten years ago when they had their risk reducing surgery, they were told that they couldn't have HRT at the time. And they were quite surprised to find out that actually that was incorrect. If someone is, say, in their mid 40s now and they have had their surgery a few years ago, um, is it worth them going on to HRT now? Or would it be, you know, are they going, oh, I've gone through the initial bit and, and you know, yeah. I'm not going to bother? No, absolutely. It's never, never too old to start considering HRT. We know from the evidence and the guidelines that women who start HRT within 10 years of their menopause, um, and that, that usually means under the age of 60 when they start taking HRT, that's when they have the most benefits with respect to reducing risk of heart disease, diabetes and so forth. So even women that don't have any symptoms or think they don't have any symptoms, they can still consider it. And Actually, you, we often find when we start people on HRT, they go, goodness me, my brain's better, my energy's better, my mood's better, my sleep's better. But they would have never attributed those symptoms to their menopause. Um, but we also see women who are older who have sort of missed that window of opportunity. So it's more than 10 years since their, their menopause. Um, and they're, they're maybe struggling with symptoms or they've read something about HRT. And because HRT is so safe and now, like I say, we can give it through the skin so there's no risk of clot. We often do start older women knowing that there's less evidence for the health benefits, although there is evidence for the bone protection. A lot of women still find that they improve. Um, 
So on my website, there is um, under resources, there's some fact sheets as well as booklets. But one of the fact sheets is specifically written for women who want to start taking HRT when it's been longer since their menopause. So some people might find that useful to look at. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, as you can imagine, a really common topic in the questions that I've been sent is around um, the HRT shortages that we've been hearing about in the media. So lots of people worrying about this, both people who've already had their surgery and those who haven't yet asking about whether this is as bad as the headlines are making out. And also a comment of um, being concerned about being reliant on a medication with such a global supply chain. So I don't know if you can comment on that a little bit for me. Yeah, it has been an absolute nightmare for about a year. Um, there was a big shortage of patches and um, there was also a shortage, which there still is, of some of the combination tablets. Now, the combination tablets doesn't bother me in the slightest because no one should really be on a combination tablet because I've already said estrogen tablet is a small risk of clots. Um, and also they contain the synthetic, the older type of progestogen. So I never prescribe them at all. So it's a good opportunity if you were on them to consider changing. The patches have been a nightmare, but they have now been um, taken over by another manufacturer. So we are getting them back again. Um, so there is sometimes there's the local problem with pharmacists if they don't order many being able to get hold of them. There's a, an organisation called um, findapharma.co.uk which is set up by a pharmacist and he can let you know where the nearest pharmacist is either for you to go and pick it up or to be sent to you. So that's a useful resource if you um, are struggling. So most people now can get it and there's not a problem. People were talking about Brexit or and now coronavirus, what, how can we get our HRT? It seems to be fine. Um, there is one thing uh, that's a problem um, with oestrogen gel is that there's a parallel import which is called oestrodose and it's, it, it's made by the same company. We're having real battles to tease out what exactly has happened but the oestrodose is weaker. So a lot of women have been on oestrogen gel, been given this parallel import and found it's weaker. If you look on my website and put in estrodose, um, which is O-E-S-T-R-O-D-O-S-E, -E, uh, we've written a, a, a leaflet about it explaining what you can do. So that's just something to be mindful of. Um, but, but otherwise, HRT actually is, is, is available. Um, and it's, so it's worth persevering. And a lot of doctors or pharmacists will say, no, there's a shortage, but there, there isn't any more to the same extent. So um, it's not a reason to not take it. That's really reassuring, actually. I think it will be for lots of people listening. Um, so thank you. Um, we had a question specifically about progesterone so and the different options for women who aren't having a full hysterectomy, um, specifically about um, whether progesterone is thought to play a positive role in other parts of your body than just your uterus. So whether there's the benefits of taking in a tablet form versus as a, with a, having a coil instead. Yeah, so the natural progesterone, the micronized progesterone or uterogestan is this body identical progesterone and it does have effects in our body and some people find they're very positive effects. So some people find it makes people feel calmer, they sleep better, we often suggest to take it at night time. Um, so people quite enjoy those side effects. Um, so some women, and not many, but those women who are still struggling, um, we do give it even if they've had a hysterectomy and they can help. There's a bit of evidence it can help with bone strength as well. But there are some women who find that they get side effects with it. It can affect the mood negatively and, and cause people to be low in their mood, less motivated, sometimes a bit of bloating. Um, and so women then we try and minimise their progesterone and there's different ways we can do that. The synthetic progesterone, so ones for example in the combination pills or even the combination patches, can cause more side effects because they stimulate other receptors in the body and um, they can cause sort of bloating, uh, weight gain, what, uh, skin changes, irritability and people sometimes find changing to the natural progesterone can be better. The Marina coil is a coil that contains a synthetic progesterone but it's a very low dose and um, so a lot of people find they tolerate it well even if they haven't tolerated progesterones in the past. It's a very small coil, it's inserted and it um, can be used for five years with oestrogen and also testosterone if needed. Um, so that can be very good for someone, for example, who needs contraception because it's a contraceptive as well. But also if women are having problems with heavy bleeding because a lot of women find that their periods stop when they use a marina coil. So it's a really good option for a lot of people. So um, 
usually we, we sort of recommend either the natural progesterone, the micronized progesterone, or the marina coil, a really good option. Okay, thank you. Um, I know you've spoken a little bit about testosterone. As you can imagine, mm. it's quite a hot topic um, mm. in lots of the questions. And you've mentioned a little bit about why it can be a bit of a battle to get hold of. Um, we've specifically had some people who've been told, even when they have been able to have it, that their team has only been willing to prescribe it for 18 months. And so they've been told to wait until they really need it before they ask for it. Is this something mm. that is general advice um, or something that is, again, kind of misinformation? No, it's, it's um, no, basically in one word, um, you know, you wouldn't castrate a man and say, let's see how you go and we'll wait till your symptoms are really bad and then we'll consider giving you back the hormone that we just removed from your body. Um, it's, it's absolutely outrageous, really, that women are spoken to like that. And um, the problem is we don't have really good long term data about testosterone use in women because it's not been done. So not because we've had dangerous data, it's just not been done because women's research is not a priority for anyone, unfortunately. Um, we do know that um, there's a reduction in risk of cardiovascular, so heart disease, um, for two years. We don't know beyond that because the studies haven't been done. So that's why I think some people think, oh, after two years, it might be awful. But, um, you know, women can um, take it um, in the longer term as well. And I don't think anyone should be waiting until they're really desperate and they're on their knees. And I see and speak to a lot of women who have given up their jobs, they've given up their partners, they've practically given up their lives because their lack of hormones has affected them so much. And, you know, this is completely wrong. We shouldn't be suffering in this way. So if anyone is told that it's absolutely wrong information, Sadly, um, very few people have, have um, education about the menopause and even less information or education about testosterone. And I certainly was given no information about testosterone as a postgraduate or an undergraduate. Um, and I've sort of taught myself, I've read a lot of data and we prescribe a lot because it makes sense. Um, and when we prescribe testosterone, we do a blood test and make sure that women still have their it's in the female range so people don't suddenly grow beards or moustaches the risk of side effects is incredibly low it's very safe it's probably one of the safest things i've ever prescribed as a doctor and has a really good um, improvement for a lot of women um, so it's very frustrating really that women can't get hold of it in a better way and um, there is some information about it on my website and increasingly i speak to women who have bought testosterone um, over the internet or they've been, been they've managed to persuade a doctor to prescribe it but it's had no prescribing instructions on it which is quite scary for me as a doctor thinking about this so if you have got hold of it make sure you've been prescribed it by someone that knows how to prescribe it knows how to monitor you as well because it is worth having blood tests undertaken um, but I, I'm hoping, we're really hoping that Androfem and the female testosterone cream can be licensed by the MHRA. They're trying to get the license in, in Australia. And if they do, it will. But I think we really need to um, campaign for it as, as women. Um, There's one thing we're trying to campaign, but I think if young women really campaign, we used to have um, a patch, a testosterone patch that was licensed for women who were young, had an early menopause or women that had a surgical menopause and the patch just went out of circulation and the license disappeared with it um, it wasn't a safety issue at all so i think we need to get vocal and, and really sort of demand for our own hormone back really absolutely um so moving on a little bit then to questions around dosages we've had um a few of these in specifically about kind of how um it is that it's found the right dose to give to of the estrogen patches for example to a woman is it that everyone is kind of put on a similar starting dose and then it's a trial and error based on symptoms you experience over time yeah so it really varies actually it is a bit like we always or sometimes say it's a bit like trying on a pair of shoes you might try on a few pairs and then you find that pair that you just love and want to keep on um, and it's it's similar really with HRT because uh, we don't do a blood test to diagnose the menopause or perimenopause because our hormones fluctuate and um, if someone's had their ovaries removed there's no point really doing it because we know it will be low because the ovaries have gone. Um, but what we want to try and do, certainly with young women, is to have physiological levels. So levels that you would be having if you were still having your periods. Um, so once a woman is on either the patch or the gel or the spray, 
and they're still experiencing symptoms, then we will often do a blood test to see whether they're absorbing it. Uh, because some women can use patches and find they don't stick on well, or they use the gel and they find it just slides off. And so they might won't be absorbing the, the right amount. And some women find that they just need higher doses because their metabolism is different. Um, and so although, although we've got maximum licensed doses, we can still use higher doses. So a lot of young women, for example, will need two, sometimes three patches together um, rather than just one or they might use eight, ten um, pumps of, of gel. Um, so it's important to have enough because if women don't have enough, they can still experience symptoms, but they can still also have these health risks. So we know women that still have some venison causal symptoms will have a higher risk of heart disease and osteoporosis than women that don't have any um, symptoms. So, it, so it's a combination sometimes of doing a blood test, but also looking at the symptoms. So, you download the questionnaire of symptoms on my, my website or the app that was just launched called Balance. It's a free app that anyone can download. It's got the symptom checker there. And we recommend every three months filling it out. And then you can just compare to how it was. And if you're on HRT and you feel that your symptoms are creeping back, then that might be a time to increase the dose. And I've already said estrogen is very safe. So increasing the dose is not going to cause any problems. The worst thing that will happen is women might get a bit of um, breast tenderness, which was usually temporary. If they've got their womb and increase the dose, they might have a bit of short-term increased bleeding. But actually that's very low problems if you're feeling well otherwise. Um, if a woman has too much HRT, that people sometimes worry about having too much, well, it only lasts a day that you have it. So if you have too much on one day of a gel, for example, it will be gone by tomorrow. That's why you have to use it every day. So it's not going to build up in the body or anything like that. So certainly for my patients, I very much like them to be in control. Um, and they can sort of experiment a bit because it is so safe. And we have to remember that the dose is a lot lower than the contraceptive pill, for example. Um we had a question specifically about, um, so for women who, for example, have a BRCA mutation and know that they're going to be having this surgery, um, is there any worthwhile um, kind of having a blood test beforehand um, and finding out what your natural levels of hormones are so that you can almost have a guideline of what your baseline is? Yeah. And actually, is that something that um, if you did that, you paid for those blood tests privately, whether an HRT specialist would accept those blood tests as a guideline, yeah. whether it's not worth doing? No, I love the way of thinking, and, it, and it would, if it was as simplistic like that, it would be great. The problem is I could do a woman's hormone test five times in the day, and I'd get five different results because they fluctuate throughout the day. I could do it on five different days, and I'd get five different results. And so we, we don't want to be matching, and there's a lot of companies now that will do blood tests, do it privately. There's a lot of companies now that do the finger prick testing, and I was looking at some just for our patients because of the lockdown we've been doing remote consultations but um, we did it on about 20 women in, in the laboratory just to see and we were getting a factor of 10 different so 10 times higher if they had a pinprick as opposed to an old-fashioned blood test from the, for the veins so they're not reliable um, and so you have to be really careful if you if you do saliva blood saliva hormone tests that's even worse so a lot of it is a marketing thing there's a lot of money to be made from menopause for the wrong reasons and so I'm I, I just hate the fact that women are losing money for this and it sounds like wouldn't it be good wouldn't it be great we do all blood tests when we're in our 30s and let's match them when we're in our 50s actually we know what the average is for women but some women we like levels of estradiol to be around three four hundred because we know that's good for our heart and bones but some women are a lot better when their levels 800 and other women their levels are 200 and feel great one of the reasons I do blood tests also is because if a woman is still having symptoms like night sweats, for example, I want to know if she's absorbing it. And if she is and her level comes back high, then she might be having night sweats because she's got a lymphoma or there's another medical reason that I don't want to miss as a doctor. So it's not just about a key number. And there's a lot of women I see who go to private clinics who get very obsessed almost about their levels because that's the way the clinics are making money is by doing these blood tests um, for women. So it, it won't help. And it's very different to 
diabetes or having a thyroid blood test, it's more about symptoms than an actual level. That's really, really useful to know, actually, because funnily enough, those ads were coming up on my timeline of things, you know, of um, certain companies of why don't you um, have yeah. a go with these blood tests? And you do automatically think that, don't you? What a good idea. Absolutely. Yeah, you can see and it does sound it's so simplistic. It sounds great. But and uh, you just don't. But you just don't know. Um, and and because the levels fluctuate, you know, and all our hormones interact. So our thyroid interacts with our and um, sex hormones. So a lot of women find that if they've got hypothyroidism, for example, their need for thyroxine changes during the perimenopause and menopause. And it often improves when they get the right hormones back. And women with type 1 diabetes who use insulin find that their insulin requirements are often a lot worse when they haven't got estrogen. So all these hormones work together. So it's it's looking at the bigger picture. And as doctors, you know, we should be here to look at the person as a whole not just this is mrs bloggs who's having her ovaries taken out actually let's look further back and let's let's take a bigger and that's what's needed to be done and so focusing in on a number and a blood test is just the wrong way to go absolutely thank you um we had a couple of questions about um bone health and dexa scans and whether it's something that um scans should be had before you have the surgery or it's something that we need to be asking for after uh, you know, at certain um, amounts of time after the surgery? So it's, um, the, the guidelines are quite willy really when it comes to DEXA scans, but if a woman has an early menopause, so they're under the age of 40, have premature ovarian insufficiency, whether it's a, a sort of natural thing or whether they've had a oophorectomy, then they should have a baseline DEXA scan and they should have it repeated at regular intervals, so usually every three to five years. If a woman is having risk reducing surgery so hasn't had a hormone problem then not all those women will fulfill a criteria for a DEXA scan and there's something called a FRAX score which is a score you can google it, it's F-R-A-X and you put in any other risk factors for osteoporosis so things like um, have you had steroids, have you a smoker, have you got a family history of osteoporosis, have you had a fracture before and it will tell you if your risk is slightly higher and then those women can often have a DEXA scan in the NHS um, but a lot of women still can't access it because their risk isn't high enough. Um, I actually strongly think that every woman should have a DEXA scan around the time of their menopause, whether it's an enforced or natural menopause, because like I've already said, you don't know what your bone density is until it's often too late, and none of us want fractures. And there's a lot of women that have osteopenia, which is when the, um, your bone density is thinner, but you haven't actually got osteoporosis. And that's the time that we really want to think about how can we improve our bone density? Um, Obviously, I've already said HRT will really help, but we need to look at our diets, look at our calcium intake. Are we taking vitamin D? Are we doing enough weight bearing exercise? You know, are we spending all day sitting in front of the computer? You know, how can we improve our bone density? And we want to do it before it's, it's dropped. And the only way is by having a DEXA scan. You can't do it from a normal x-ray. Okay, thank you. Um, we also had um, several questions from women with BRCA mutations who've already been had a diagnosis of breast cancer. Um, just as an example, a lady who has a BRCA2 mutation um, and had ER positive breast cancer in, diagnosed in 2015 at age 39, um, which pushed her into the menopause. She had a prophylactic oophorectomy after her cancer treatment. On her first DEXA scan a year later, she discovered they discovered osteoporosis, and she also mentioned several other symptoms, um, uh, menopause symptoms. But she says she's been advised not to take HRT. So, uh, kind of a question around that of um, people who have had a diagnosis of breast cancer, whether ER positive or negative, um, and when is appropriate for somebody to have HRT or not? It's very, very difficult. Um, I have done an Instagram live about. Um women who've had cancer which might be worth listening to. I've also done a podcast recently with uh, someone called Tony Branson who's an oncologist in Newcastle and we're talking more specifically about women who've had breast cancer. The problem is we haven't got good evidence, we haven't got good research and so it's a lot easier as a knee-jerk reaction for a doctor to say no you can't. But they're not living that woman's life and they're not um, experiencing the same symptoms as they are. Um, as a general rule of thumb, if a woman's had an oestrogen receptor negative breast cancer, then they can usually take HRT. 
Women who've had oestrogen receptor positive breast cancer, I've already said, can safely use vaginal oestrogen because that's not the same as systemic HRT. And then it's looking then, at, as I've already said, at the individual, you know, how long ago was the breast cancer? What treatment did they have? Um, what size, what grade, what stage of the, the cancer? And what other symptoms they've tried? Uh, what, sorry, what other treatments they've tried? So looking at um, some of the other alternatives, some people find the simple measures such as um, acupuncture can help or um, aromatherapy can help. Um, or doing sort of changing exercise, changing diet. So looking at simple measures, but there are some women that are still really struggling with their symptoms because they have no estrogen in their body. Um, and so some women we do give a low dose of HRT to, um, knowing that we don't know whether it's going to make things better or worse because we don't have any evidence. But a lot of women who have tried everything will say to me, but I, I can't carry on like this. I'm finding it really difficult. And for some women, it might be that they are on, for example, tamoxifen and they have six weeks without tamoxifen and, and that's enough to, to see that some women need HRT as well. And it's very difficult because oncologists have been taught you can't give HRT and doctors have been taught you can't give HRT, but you can never say never. Um, and the guidelines are very clear that women can be given an individual consultation and we can consider HRT if, if nothing else has helped. And women are, and men are allowed to undertake risks for treatment if everything else has not helped. Um, so not just about HRT, there are other treatments that have risks. Um, surgery has risks but people decide to do have a, sur a surgical procedure because they want the beneficial side of it, knowing that there are risks. And HRT is no different, um, but we don't have data. And in fact, there is some data to show that women who've had an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer actually do better when they have HRT, like I've said before. We usually use very low dose. And sometimes we give people for a few months, so three months, and then they can review and see how they feel. I've already said oestrogen won't cause breast cancer, so it's not going to suddenly activate something, um, but it's sometimes then easier to make a decision regarding how you feel. Um, so you can't just sort of say, everyone who's had oestrogen receptor breast cancer is all in the same box and they can or can't have something. It's about looking at their symptoms, the, the time since their surgery, what type of treatments they've had and and often we work very closely with the oncologists and the GPs as well so it's a joint decision really. Thank you. Um, we also had a question sent in um, about vaginal atrophy. Um, the question says um, whilst it's, it seems quite a common thing to happen for women um, and while she doesn't want to over medicate she's also concerned that it seems that people need to first get to kind of a disease state before they're then treated so is there a way of monitoring the cellular health of the vagina to be able to intervene as soon as possible mm. um, so you can start using local estrogen straight away as soon as you might need it? It's quite difficult because it's, it, this vaginal dryness, um, they, they changed the term, it used to be called vulvovaginal atrophy. But if you look up the word atrophy, it actually means wasting or withering away and none of us want to be wasting or withering away. So they've changed the terminology to a GSM, so it's genitourinary syndrome of the menopause and that in some ways is better because it includes the urinary symptoms but also it's quite a mouthful. Um, and these symptoms really vary. So some people find they come on very gradually, so they don't even realize they've got them until they get a lot worse. Some people find it can happen overnight, but they suddenly get this incredible, awful pain that keeps them up in the nighttime. They can't, wiping themselves when they go to the toilet is uncomfortable. Like I said, sitting down is uncomfortable. So it really, really varies. The most important thing is to just be mindful that this might happen. So if you haven't got your ovaries, if you've gone through the menopause, there's a high risk that you will get symptoms and it might be immediately or it might be 10, 20, 30 years after your menopause. Um, um, but it's, you, it's easier to treat before it's got too severe um, because I've seen and spoken to a lot of women who have had symptoms for far too long and been really struggling. So if people have got symptoms, have it sooner um, and if you think the vagina is lined by cells and so these cells respond to estrogen 
So without estrogen, the cells, the lining of the vagina becomes thinner. There's less blood supply there. There's less lubrication. There's a change in pH, so more likely to get infections. And also the lining of the uh, urethra, where we wee out of, becomes thinner. So more prone to infections as well. Um, so when all this becomes thinner and atrophic, um, that's when symptoms often start. But if you start treatment with localized estrogen, it will help reverse all this process. So it will help thicken the cells, bring more moisture into the cells. It will alter the pH, the acidity again. It will bring the blood supply back. So what you don't want to do is wait till your symptoms are so much worse because it will take a lot more effort, if you like, for the estrogen to have its effect and it will take longer as well. Um, and actually I spoke to someone in my clinic yesterday who said, I have no idea I had symptoms or, until I started using localised oestrogen and now I realise, gosh, I feel so much better than I've done for years because it, it, it's a very, if it's very gradual, you just get used to the changes. But it's worth just, just thinking or, you know, have you had urinary tract infections? You know, are you going to the toilet more frequently? Are you finding coughing or sneezing your wing more, or you're running to the toilet um, more than you were getting up in the night time to pass urine? All these are very sort of soft signs that it might be related to this genital urinary syndrome of the menopause. And having a, a course of um, localized estrogen will let you know, but it's very important that if it helps, you have to take it forever. So you, um, without localised oestrogen, all those symptoms will come back. It's, it's things like symptoms such as hot flushes can go sometimes with, with time, sometimes it can be a few years, but the symptoms related to vaginal dryness, once they start, they'll never go. So some doctors say, oh, you can have six months of treatment and then you have to stop, see how you get on. That's absolute rubbish. You really need to have it forever. And the dose is incredibly low. Also, you can imagine when you're using local oestrogen, and I've already said the thickness of the vagina improves, then you're going to get less absorbed. So the amount that's absorbed for the, when you use it for longer term is less because there's less for it to get through. So it's incredibly safe. Um, some people say that women who have an aromatase inhibitor that blocks oestrogen completely shouldn't use local oestrogen, but there's no good evidence to support that. And most of the key people that I work with are very happy that women still use localised oestrogen regardless of their treatment. Um, a question then that just came to my mind then as you were speaking is, um, a lot of these examples, as you've said, are, you know, um, people who are medical professionals who haven't necessarily been taught the facts along the way. If somebody has gone to their GP and they've asked for this advice and they've been told you can have this for a short amount of time and that's it, what do you suggest they do if they're not in the position to see somebody privately, say, or, you know, if they might be in a small village with one GP? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really difficult. So there's a few things you should... Um, talk to them about the NICE guidance, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence guidelines, because they're very clear about a lot of this. Um, download some information from my website. I'm very happy for any of you to quote me. I'm very happy to talk to any GPs. I get emails all the time from GPs and I often talk to them. Um, we're launching a menopause education program, which will come out in the next few weeks. So that will make a difference. Um, you know, it's your right as a woman. And so it's really difficult. I get very scared going to see the doctor because I feel I'm wasting their time and their, their stress and, you know, oh gosh, vaginal dryness, how trivial. Well, of course it's not trivial. It's really important. So it's sometimes writing a letter to your GP rather than doing it face to face can make a difference. Or take someone with you, um, you know, use them as a spokesperson, you know, or, you know, just have, collect your thoughts, get some information. Um, I've written a book, the um, Haynes Menopause Manual. You know, have a read of that. Just, just feel strong. And you know, it's very hard because you know we're all being used to told things, being told things. But if you can do a mind check, or, or you know, the, your your charity is amazing. You know, use the people on the charity and say, what, "What's Doctor Newsom right? Did she say this? Because my doctor's saying this." Actually, if it feels right, it probably is. So you just have to. Um, you know, and sometimes it can be a nurse rather than the doctor. So it might be a nurse in the surgery who's better. Or some people actually change practice. So if you've got a local Facebook group, that can be very useful to say, does anyone know, you know, is there a, a local GP or nurse that I can see? There are some places that do NHS menopause clinics. Um, 
I've already said I think mine's private because I can't get a job in the NHS but I'm doing some work with the NHS in sort of quite a high level so I'm hoping that will change over the next few years as well. Um, I'm really aware that we're coming to the end of our time but one quick final question um, on the subject of using localised oestrogen for vaginal dryness can you use that alongside HRT patches um, or is it one or the yeah, other? Absolutely that's a really good question and around 20% 20, 20%, so one in five women need to use both um, and it's absolutely safe so if you're on HRT and still experiencing symptoms then you can and there are also non-hormonal lubricants moisturizers as well um, the best ones are by a company called Yes and Regel and Silk S-Y-L-K um, you can get them online or get them through chemists um, and use a combination so some people find some people need to use more than the licensed dose of localised oestrogen as well. The dose is incredibly low, so using it more frequently is still very safe. Brilliant, thank you. I'm really aware, um, everybody, that we've got lots more questions that we haven't managed to get through. So um, one thing I did want to um, read out was someone saying, what can we do to help the testosterone campaign? I think we all should rise up and start a petition or something, everyone on this call, to sort it out. So um, thanks for, you know, that, that enthusiasm. Yeah, well, we, I'm actually, I've got another meeting bang on now, actually, because we're setting up a menopause charity. And that's our, certainly we want the charity to be a voice for women. So if any of you want to sort of, help with our crusade then I'm sure um, you know, emails can be forwarded to me and we can start something going because you know this has got to be run by women led by women and we've got to make changes so I'm um, very happy for anyone to help because I'm quite tired with some of the work that I do but I feel it's really important. Brilliant, thank you so much. And what I'll do is I will download all the questions that we haven't managed to answer. And if it's okay, um, Dr. Newson, I'll try and lump them together into some themes in Absolutely, case there's some things fine. we can pull out there. But thank you so much for giving us your time today. That has been so useful for me personally, and I'm sure it has Good. been for watching well, as well. Thank, thank you for inviting me. No, it's really, really important. So thank you thank very much. And good luck with the, the charity side of things. Please keep us all in uh, up to date with that as well, because I'm sure we've got lots of people that would love to help you out with that. So Great, fantastic. Bye. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. Thank you so much everybody um, we will send you around a link for the recording so that you can re-watch all of this when you need to so thanks everybody and see you all soon